Okay. So now I figure it's a good opportunity to introduce us. Hey, hey, everybody, welcome. Thank you for joining us. So you're here for data and evaluation going from zero to one. This is CoFX's third uh, virtual workshop of 2023. And we couldn't be more excited because featuring Betsy Mercado and Ryan Hazelton uh, today. So two of the two of the awesome uh, nonprofit leaders that we've had the opportunity to work with over the years. You know, when I was talking with Ryan over the summer, we were wrapping up a project and I was just thinking, oh, you know, it's it's so impressive to see somebody that leads a really small organization that still is able to do good data and evaluation work. I realized this might be an opportunity to highlight some examples for, of this kind of thing from the CoEffect Network. So the motivation for, for this is really hoping to share some insights from their work leading quite small teams who are quite resource constrained and are still doing quite good stuff in terms of data and evaluation. So <clears throat> I'll provide a little bit more about, about them as we get in here and, and tell you a little bit about where this is going. But just so you've got that context, this is the topic we're talking about today. We're here for uh, 90 minutes. So if, and I imagine many of you may have to drop out after an hour, that is totally fine. We're going to share the uh, recording from this afterward as well. So if you miss any parts of this, that's fine. We'll have you covered. So some of the things we're trying to cover today, we want to make sure that everybody here understands. And I think if you're here, you probably already do understand why is data and evaluation so important for a nascent, for a small nonprofit organization? How does it contribute to your growth and your impact? As I mentioned, we're featuring Mariposa Kids and Objective Zero. These are two small teams that have successfully developed and imp implemented an evaluation strategy. So I want you to learn from their experience. They're going to be talking much more than I am. I'm just saying the stage. Uh, we want to also ideally talk a little bit about what kinds of funding support this work and how that influences how you approach learning and evaluation, identify strategies for navigating common challenges, and just get some practical tips from Ryan and Betsy's real-world experience, having built out data and evaluation at their organizations. So I would love for y'all to tell us just a little bit about yourself. Hopefully I'm getting Zoom right here. I'm going to launch a poll. So for everybody that's in this, you should see two questions. One, I want you to share, just like tell, tell me a little bit about the context that you operate in. You know, are you a consultant? Are you a nonprofit person? Are you a government person? And then the second question that I want to pose here in this poll is, tell me a little bit about the size of the organization that you're representing. So, so for everybody who's just joined, Welcome. You're here for going to zero, going from zero to one with data and evaluation. And we've got a poll up. We'd love to just learn a little bit about you. So please complete this. As soon as I see we've got about 90, 95% of people who completed the poll, then we'll end this and we'll we'll kind of show where folks are at. Okay. Awesome. We are at 95%. I'm ending this poll, share these results with y'all. Can you see this? Yeah, hopefully. Cool. It looks like most of us here are nonprofit staff followed by consultant, which makes sense because I'm a consultant and Betsy and Ryan are nonprofit leaders. So you're in good company. In terms of how large your organization's at, so we have several people who are in a one-person organization, like it's just me, or two to five full-time employees, the rest six to 20, and then a few people that represent quite large organizations. Welcome. I'm super glad you're here. Betsy and Ryan's story, I think, is very relevant for folks who are working within and with smaller organizations. And so that's particularly why I want to highlight this. But but I do think that it's it's going to be helpful, you know, even if that doesn't describe you as well. So... So thank you. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I wanted to, so I want to thank everybody that contributed to some of this. Some of you represent some of these organizations on the right. These are the folks that have helped get the word out about this. CoEffect is a nonprofit consulting practice. We've got an email list and we sent, sent this out and asked if folks were interested in joining, but we also shared it with our partners and our partners shared it with other folks. So if you're one of these partners, thank you so much. And then let's let's talk a little bit about Objective Zero and Mariposa Kids. So I'll tell you a little bit about Betsy and Ryan, and then I'll turn it over to them to introduce themselves. So so I've worked I worked with Betsy. Gosh, our working relationship went back probably 
three, four years at this point. Objective Zero is a nonprofit organization really dedicated to building peer connections among the veteran community. They have a mobile app. And so it's a really tech enabled nonprofit, but it's a really small team. And I had the opportunity of working with Betsy and her team. I see Gloria is on the call too. Hey, Glory, to start setting up a lot of their fundamental data and evaluation processes, gosh, three or four years ago. I've just always been super impressed with their work. They're doing work on a really important mission. They've got a national and even international scale, yet they're, they're a team of just a handful of people and many, many talented volunteers make it happen. So, so that's a little bit about my relationship with Betsy and then Ryan. So I actually had the opportunity to overlap as a coworker of Ryan's for, I think maybe a week or two uh, in a prior life. And um, Ryan is now the executive director of Mariposa Kids, which is an after school program that uh, really focuses on play-based learning in the San Francisco area. And so they're doing some really fantastic work. And, and Ryan and I actually had the opportunity to collaborate. He hired me to help sort of be their data coach, if you will, um, because they'd never done any evaluation work. And so uh, I will say Ryan did 95 to 98% of the heavy lifting, but I got to play a small part in the journey and help kind of guide their work in, in that realm. And they've done some really impressive stuff that they will tell you about later. So, so with that, Maybe, Betsy, I'll turn it over to you to give a more formal introduction of yourself. Just share a little bit about your background, your organization, and then Ryan, I'll let you do the same, all right? Wonderful. Paul, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to be part of this panel. My name is Betsy Mercado. I am one of the co-founders and the executive director of the Objective Zero Foundation. And like Paul said, we're a tech nonprofit that's connecting the military and community, uh, veteran community, which we define as service members, veterans, their families, and caregivers to a global network of volunteer peer support through text, voice, and video chat. And we're also getting them connected to mental health and wellness resources um, as an upstream approach to prevent suicide. Um, we were founded in 2016 and just been kind of trucking along since then. Also on this call in the audience is one of my colleagues, Glory. So if, if questions pop up that I don't address, I, I'm sure she can, she can grab those. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for this opportunity, Paul. Absolutely. Thank you, Betsy. And go ahead, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Ryan Hazelton, and I'm the executive director of Mariposa Kids. Mariposa Kids is a small nonprofit in San Francisco, and we're serving 40 children in grades TK through 5 with um, out-of-school time programming. So that includes an after-school program and then also summer camps. Our summer camp numbers are a little bit higher, but we are a, a, a small team. So we have two full-time employees and then uh, five to six part-time employees that work throughout the year. Our budget is $335,000 a year. And my background is in fundraising. So I've been fundraising for child serving nonprofits for the last 12 years before coming into Mariposa Kids as the executive director. So when it came to data, I uh, didn't know a lot. I was in fundraising. So I could ask you for money, but if you asked me to figure out how to do a survey, um, I really had no idea. So um, I'm happy to share what I learned on this journey with all of you here and glad that you could join us. So thanks, Paul, for bringing us all together. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I, everybody, I wanted to, in, I was ex exceptionally uh, excited to invite Betsy and Ryan because I think that their organizations do rather different stuff. They come from rather different backgrounds. They serve pretty, I mean, I, I don't know two populations that could be more different, but I think there are a lot of overlaps around how, how you approach the challenge uh, of data and evaluation, how you navigate it, and some of the some of the potential roadblocks that come up along the way. So I, I'm always excited to bring folks that have rather different perspectives, but maybe share similarities that aren't visible on the surface together in conversation. So that's what we're going to be doing here today. So let me let me just share a couple more things to set the stage for this. Our agenda here looks like this, and essentially, this is like a panel discussion. So Betsy and Ryan have some slides. You only see a few slides from me, but we'll be talking through their data journey, why this matters, 
and then talking through some of the mechanics, like establishing their theory of change, establishing some of their data and collect data collection habits, what analysis and data products looks like for each of them, how they've navigated certain challenges and how they funded this work. So that's the overall arc. We'll get through as much of it as we can. Also just wanting to be respectful of y'all's time. We won't go over 90 minutes for this thing. And I'll be sure to share these slides in the recording out afterwards. So I think most of y'all are familiar with CoEffect. For those who, who aren't, so this is my consulting practice. Uh, CoEffect is a small firm. We, we, are, we have a team of myself and a handful of other people uh, all dedicated to helping nonprofits build their data foundations. And that means the following to us. So you need to have a strategy around how we understand our impact. You need to have habits for data collection and analysis, and you need to have effective data systems that don't get in your way. So these three things come together to help you learn and grow over time. They have a foundation underneath of them. That's the foundation of individual data literacy. So just being comfortable with data and using it. And then a foundation of having a culture of learning. That is how we come together as a team to interact with data and learn from it over time. So CoEffect helps nonprofits establish these things through consulting, coaching, and training. And so we've had the opportunity to work with uh, folks like Objective Zero, like Mariposa Kids, and about 63 other organizations over the past seven years. We're based in Denver, Colorado, but work with folks across the nation. And actually, Betsy is now located in, in South Korea, so across the world, technically. And it's, it's just been a really fun journey. So, so a lot of folks think about this sort of data journey as maybe looking like this. And for those of you who haven't seen something like this before, this, this is formally called the evidence continuum. It's based on work that the Colorado Evidence-Based Policy Collaborative has done, but there's actually a number of different entities that have something like this, where essentially they say, okay, we, we know that there are different levels of data work happening at organizations. The most basic level, step one, is just having a, a program design. This is having a theory of change that says, here's the intended impact. The fifth and final step is having very strong causal evidence in the form of a randomized control trial or some kind of experimental trial. And then there's various steps in between. And so this, this mental model of the data journey is helpful in some ways because it gives you a sense of like, what do we tackle in what order roughly? And so if you just had read this without having done the work, you might think, oh, well, this is a pretty linear sequence. Cool. The reality is there's sort of a sequence kind of more like this. <laughs> so please excuse my like nasty scribble here, but I think it illustrates a point that you start by having some expectations. Then you need to start measuring your outputs and your outcomes. You collect some data, you learn from that. You hopefully share what you learned. You try and do it better next year. And you probably do that a few times over, you know, that, that this cycle in here is sort of this sort of, if folks are familiar with this sort of like the plan do you know, plan, do, learn, act cycle, you know, or plan, do, check, act. That that sort of frame of like having learning cycles is kind of the more accurate way to think about the data journey. And it gets better and better over time. So you have to start somewhere. You don't have to make it incredibly complex, but it's not a linear path. Ideally, going through this path, you end up getting more resources and funding for your program in general, and also to do the data and learning work even better, and it becomes a virtuous cycle. But sometimes it can be easy to get mired somewhere in here too, and that's 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 what I like to help folks avoid. And one of the reasons I wanted to highlight Ryan and Betsy's perspective, because they've, despite all the challenges of working in small organizations, avoided getting mired or stuck and have been able to continue doing useful stuff with data and evaluation over time. So anyway, that's all the context I wanted to share. So now, Betsy and Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to y'all. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. My first question to you is, could you just describe your organization's data journey? You know, if you can describe it in sort of, you know, Reader's Digest format, five minutes or less, that would be great. Betsy, why don't I turn it over to you first? And then would love to hear from Ryan too, all right? That sounds great. You know, like you said before, Paul, and look at it in a way that helps us understand our impact. 
we've been able to collect data since the day object the Objective Zero app was launched. And it actually looks a lot different than it did five years ago, what it does today, uh, which really does show how far that we've come along in this process. And when I look back you know, early on in our journey, and even to this day, we're often asked, how many lives have we saved? How many suicides have we prevented? And to be quite honest, that's just a number that I can't tell you and I, I probably never will be able to. And so, you know, we, we have the anecdotal evidence that, you know, we're saving veterans lives or getting people connected to resources before they're hitting that moment of crisis or even after. Um, but like I said, we, we can't tell you how many lives that we've saved. So we went through this tech accelerator several years ago in Denver called Visible Connect. And that's actually where I met Paul. And I had the opportunity to sit down with him and discuss some of our pain points and then think about the data that we're collecting and thinking about ways that we can measure our impact. And about a year later, we started our first program evaluation project with the support of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And then over the course of three years, we were able to work with the CDC evaluation experts, and it really helped us build the capacity to take on these efforts ourselves in subsequent years. And we're on, we just finished our fourth evaluation. Each evaluation that we've done has been different. We've done process and outcomes-based and some mixtures of some of these evaluations. And, you know, we've worked with Paul over the course of, you know, I think two and a half, three years, and we were able to hire on another person during that time period as well, Glory. And one of her focuses, her job within her job description is specifically on program evaluation. And so um, we've updated some of our data collection points. We've built dashboard, dashboards that visualize our data in a way for our team that's easy to understand. And we've identified ways to continually improve our data collection efforts. Um, we've increased the ways that we're collecting data from simply relying on the data that's collected from our app to building feedback forms, um, building in-app surveys, and um, leveraging HubSpot to um, organize several lines of our efforts. And then finally, leaning on our development team to improve the functionality of our app based on all that feedback. And so we've, we're putting in the plans now for 2024 for our fifth program evaluation that using those skills that we've built over the last four, four plus years. And I will turn it over to Ryan. Great. Thank you. Yes, Paul, I don't know if you know, I worked for Reader's Digest before I jumped into nonprofit as a digital advertiser. So that's what got me into nonprofit world was not wanting to do that anymore and wanting to serve people. So... I arrived at Mariposa Kids two years ago, and at that time, we were just starting to go from virtual learning to in-person uh, learning and schools being back open for in-person activity. And so at that time, so much of our organization was just focused on getting kids and families readjusted to an in-person environment, even staff at that point. And, it, you know, I came into that new environment seeing that, but then also having to assess where the organization was at. The organization had been around for 10 years, so I was walking into something that was well-established. However, it didn't have some of the foundational pieces that I knew well-established nonprofits needed, and particularly there wasn't a strong fundraising piece to it. And so to ensure sustainability, which is you know my job as executive director, it was really important for me to start looking at how do I make sure that we are a sustainable operation, particularly the fact that we survived the pandemic and came out of it with even with a little bit of extra reserves from PPP loans, which helped us have some security to take some steps moving forward. So our first step, we didn't have any explicit mission, vision, and values. I could see that we were clearly working through and the lens of mission, vision, and values, but they weren't clearly articulated. So my first step was really just to start there. And thankfully, the bones were there. I just had to put them all together and use my marketing background, essentially, to figure out how to clearly articulate them. So the board, my board was really supportive in that, and we were able to put that together within a few months. So that was really our first piece in figuring out how to tell our story and that is what I knew we needed to build a strong fundraising platform. But similar to Betsy, like I couldn't tell you numbers of anything. 
when I walked in, there was no data collected. And so in order to fundraise, I was like, I don't, I'm going to need to be able to talk about the work. How am I going to do that? I know we're doing good work. Kids are happy. They're feeling good. They're, they're laughing, but I can't send that to a funder in their uh, proposals. I can't share that in all these different avenues. So how do I articulate that in a more clear way? And so for us, and for me particularly, get, starting a data journey was about having information to share about the success of our programs because I could see it and feel it, but I needed something to articulate it better. So for me, data was that first step. And I knew that in San Francisco, out of school time programming is there's less spots than there are children who need it. And so I knew down the road we were going to need to expand. And I knew that meant us being able to focus. We needed data in order to expand properly. And so we started this journey, we got the data, and now we're in a space where we're putting metrics in new, new places that we never did before. And we're involving all levels of our staff. So our part-time employees are doing it bi-weekly in a way that is approachable and easy and allows me to see the work that's happening and very clearly go out into the community and talk about it, which is the most exciting part for us. Yeah, absolutely. And that reminded me, one of the things I think I've learned most from both of you is how important it is to plan to share something externally. Like if you're doing this data work, there there should be something that you can you can share with your community about it. And both of your organizations have done a really great job of it. You'll get into sharing, you know, what that looks like here in a bit. But I just want to reflect back and say that's that's something that you know, I came at this work from being the sort of internal data and evaluation person at like a, you know, somewhat large, like a 60 person nonprofit. And so I never had that lens of like, oh, there's something we should share publicly. It was all about sharing within the team. And that's valuable, but especially when you're a small team, it needs to also have some like external relevance. And people honestly care. Like even if the results aren't like perfect or impeccable, it's still a helpful thing to show we care enough about our work to collect some data about it. And let's, let's share with you transparently the things that we're learning along the way. So I just want to share, like, that was part of the data journey that I didn't realize the importance of until I had the opportunity to work with organizations like yours. Um, Ryan, you start getting into this a little bit. So I, I wanted to post to both of you, like, okay, why is, why is, you know, starting this data and evaluation journey so essential for a small nonprofit organization? I just totally realized there's a lot of folks here who probably run a small organization. Everything's a priority and there are so many different areas to pay attention to, you know, as you're growing a small team and trying to make it something greater and achieve your mission. Why is it so important to put some focus on this area? I'll let either one of you speak. I think you all can pick. I hit the unmute button first, Betsy, you mind if I go? All right. So for me, it was about adding depth and layers to our organization's story and our work. And I also needed to know where our work needed to make changes. I needed to have an understanding of if our resources were allocated correctly. I needed to have an understanding of if we were positioning ourselves in the community correctly. You know, a lot of nonprofits have other nonprofits that are doing similar work or adjacent work. And I needed to know how our work fit into that. And it was important for, for me to have data behind that to make sure that that kind of work was happening. It also, I felt like it, I needed to have something some some of those numbers to add a sense of confidence in when I was talking about the work to communicate our work to our constituents. You know, for our organization, families are trusting us with the welfare of their children, and so in or it they feel a, they feel better sense of confidence when I can tell them these are things that we're looking at. We're we're actually trying. We're reviewing our programs because we care. So for us, do it was important to start the data journey and have data because for me it was a way to say we care, um, and we want to show you that through these numbers. And we're not just putting your kids in a room and making sure that you get them alive. It, we wanted it to be so much more than that. And data was a way for that to happen. 
And I also needed to know that our resources were allocated correctly because we're so small and we have such limited resources. Data was a way to figure that out and do it and take a bird's eye view for, of that and be able to communicate it to staff more effectively. So I find that those pieces are really important for especially nonprofits to dive in to doing that. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I think about, you know, when Objective Zero started, I, I knew the importance of evaluation. I just didn't know kind of where to start or how to get involved in that, but I knew that it was important. And, you know, looking back, I think the earlier an organization can implement data and evaluation efforts, the, the better. You know, when it's part of the culture, your team is brought in, you know, all bought in, you see results. And luckily, once we implemented some of our data procedures and our evaluation efforts, our board specifically were on board immediately. They saw the value in that. And it was Glory and I on the team. And so, you know, we were obviously bought in too. But, you know, at, at the beginning stages, we just didn't have the bandwidth to focus on it. But, you know, seeing the hard work and the outcomes that we've um, observed, you know, I only wish we would have found a way to start this sooner. Um, you know, we've seen with, you know, with our evaluations that we're seeing growth in the number of people that we're helping within the military and veteran community. We're onboarding new volunteers, we're building new partnerships, and we have seen tremendous growth in our fundraising efforts, specifically grants. I think when uh, organizations can communicate their impacts and have the data to back it up, stakeholders notice. One thing that I've observed with Objective Zero, and I think what we've done really well, is we're taking the results of our evaluation efforts to make updates and changes to our programs and services to make them better. And like Ryan said, you know, it's, it's a way that we're showing that we care. You know, for example, we've taken some of the data and the feedback that we've received from our couple, our last couple of evaluations to basically redesign the Objective Zero app and build upon our existing suicide prevention training. It's a phenomenal new resource and we're actually just got released in the last couple of weeks, uh, which we're really thrilled about and we'll be doing more evaluation on that. <laughs> um, it never ends, but, but we've worked with our, our partners to share results and some of the trends that we've picked up on, uh, like changes in the way that our community is uh, communicating. Um, we've seen switches between phone calls to text, and then it goes back to, to phone calls or video calls. So it, it ebbs and flows. And then that in turn has increased outcomes for our community and reaffirmed that we're on the right track in many instances. Um, one thing I do want to note, and I would love your perspective on this, Ryan and Paul, you know, one of the trends that I'm seeing within fundraising and grant applications is questions about around evaluation, impact, how uh, you're measuring success and ensuring that those tools are already in place. So with evaluation and data, we're able to paint a picture of not only what's going right, but also ways we want to improve and, and get more funding so we can make those improvements. And then also the importance of feedback from our community to provide better programs, service, and training. And for us, you know, we have the data and the evaluation that backs up, you know, we're saying what we're, we're doing what we say we do. And I think it's important for the people that we serve to see, hey, Objective Zero is listening. You know, one of our mottos is we're here to listen. And so, you know, we're literally taking that, that listening tool and making sure that the veterans and service members and families that we're serving know that they're being listened to, not just through their peers, but uh, for us as an organization. Yeah, Betsy, I think your comment about feedback is particularly important for those organizations like ours that are serving people or clients or constituents of some sort, including that feedback and those feedback loops as part of the process. I find, and then to tie back to your comment about fundraising, I find that a lot of funders and government and uh, institutional uh, foundation funders also want to know that you are getting that feedback from those you serve. And and I think as we we look at you know DEI being equitable and inclusive, there's a lot top down approaches mean that you think you know what you're doing 
is right and you just tell people down below that's what it is that feedback loop means that you're actually saying hey tell me what's going right and wrong so that we can adjust to better serve you and so a lot of government funders and institutional funders i think are appreciating that and you know we can say the word data a lot but i do think feedback is actually a, a great additional word to use in these conversations because that's what a lot of it is about yeah yeah absolutely ryan and you know one thing that what you both mentioned was bringing up for me too is that when when i use the word data i'm thinking you know like we're we're talking both quantitative and qualitative information like both like numbers about impact but also some kind of like you know, regular or systematic approach of collecting stories about impact. And both are important. I've seen, I've heard from some of my clients, there's more, there's, there's in the last maybe year or two, a little bit more emphasis on some of the qualitative aspects, especially for organizations where you're addressing like pretty intractable challenges that are like really tricky to solve. Like you can actually understand more about the, that from a story than you often can from a set of numbers alone. And so I just want to, I guess, provide a clarification for everybody on this. At least when I use that term, when I use the term data, I think about both. And evaluation is often defined as just simply like a systematic approach to collecting this qualitative or quantitative data that's in service to an, an objective or in service to an end. And so, you know, that kind of gets us into our next point. How, how do you know, like, what are the objectives that you're trying to measure? Like, what are the things that you care about and you're focusing this practice on? And that's where we get into this concept of having a theory of change or something like that, that says, here are our intended changes in the world. So I would love for you both to just like kind of share what that looks like for your organization, give people sort of a visual on different different options for this and, you know, maybe share share a little bit of like, um, how did you create this theory of change? Well, I will jump in and I'm going to share my screen, Paul, if you would let me know if you can see it. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can, we can see Canva now. Fantastic. So when I, th I think when I, when you think about theory of change or the logic model, as we describe it, you know, this is one of the products that I personally am most proud of. And this for objective zero is a living document. And I have, uh, I have a printout copy of it. I am always, I, I, sh I have it memorized, but I still have the printout. Um, and we, we, we access it frequently. And so uh, when preparing for this event, I actually went back four years to look at our, our first logic model. <laughs> and it literally was a list of things as we, we prepped for it. And, you know, what you see on the screen now is before we actually developed the logic model, we thought about some of the assumptions that we held and some of the context or the theories that we are using as kind of proof of concept or evidence-based or informed suicide prevention and suicide intervention theories that prove that you know peer support is, is helpful, caring messages and, and resources are helpful in this space. And so I'm, I'm not exactly sure where this idea came from, but it was really helpful for us to go through these before creating our logic model. And I will say that while most of the initial assumptions that revolve around crisis were actually proved to be false, and so I'll address that in a later logic model, but as you can see here is kind of that very first draft. And you'll see that, you know, we, we kind of concentrated heavily on some of the inputs and activities and maybe and not so you. much. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm just seeing, I'm seeing our mission, the, the one that says our mission and it's big and blue. So just want to confirm that that's the thing you want to show. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. The, yep, absolutely. I'm talking about the inputs and activities and resources and less on the outputs and outcomes. And as we kind of went through the iterative process, the next thing that we did was develop what you see on the screen now. And through several iterations, we came up with this and you can see that we narrowed down or combined some of the inputs and activities. And then we were able to develop and expand on some of the outputs and outcomes after a lot of back and forth. And we really had to think about kind of, you know, everything that's shown on this entire logic model or theory of change from our team and volunteers to how our partners in the technology 
we built work in tandem with, you know, and, and how it allows us to complete activities and outputs. Um, we found that adding the arrows in this was really helpful for the visualization. Let's see here, I think. Yeah, Betsy, you might need to advance advance the slide or maybe you're showing a different not. screen. Let me try this again, I'm so sorry. Go back here. Got a Try this again. Can you see the blue with the blue one now? The blue logic or the. No, we just see slide three mission connecting the military community to mental health. Oh. Now I see slide. Now I see four. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm just not going to put it on presentation or. Yeah, that's fine. Um, sorry about that. But this was the initial one, just kind of a list of things. And um, this is what I was discussing, um, adding in some of the arrows so that we can, for us, it was easy to visualize how everything is interconnected. The outputs were especially important as it helped us understand the data that we were collecting and then how it translated into our outcomes. Let me go like that. So you can actually see the whole thing. And then we really had to think about part about our impact and really what we wanted to accomplish in the future and how this all kind of worked together. One of the kind of aha moments that we had when drafting this logic model is that we cannot confuse activity with progress. We can be doing a million things, but if it's not going towards our end goals of our, our outcomes and impact, kind of what are we doing? This really allows us to visualize how everything is connected and then it helps us in avoiding mission creep. And I know that's often that that comes up. So this is kind of our guiding light. I did want to show what our logic model looks like now. We have changed and updated it considerably. And you'll see under kind of the outputs that we added in the number of community members that were connected to crisis services because we found that not all veterans that are reaching out for support that a very small percentage are actually in crisis. And so we can do a warm handoff to the veterans crisis line or 911, or it's still just connecting with a peer. But for us, it was really important to add in that. Also of note, we actually added in data evaluation, data collection, and research design and testing as part of our activities. We wanted to make sure that was a fundamental activity that really drives a lot of what we're doing. We're actually working on a brand new version of this or updated version uh, because we've released version 2.0 of the Objective Zero app and it has new evidence-based features. Uh, so we'll have more activities, outputs, and outcomes to come. I will stop sharing quick here and turn it over to Ryan. All right, thank you. So I will go ahead and share Mariposa Kids theory of change. So the first thing that I'll say here is that this would not have been possible, and Paul didn't pay me or ask me to say this, but it would not have been possible without meeting with Paul biweekly. Um, and that's because there are so many competing priorities when you're in these small nonprofits and doing the work. It is so easy to just say, I'll do that tomorrow. I knew that we would be doing good work with or without a theory of change, and so that meant I could push it off another month and it would be okay because our work could continue. I actually needed an accountability buddy of sorts and someone to have a scheduled meeting with on a bi-weekly basis to say, this is what I'm going to deliver at this time. And this is the timeline that that's going to happen. So my suggestion to anybody here would be find that person, whether it be a board member, a colleague, find someone who will say, show me this work in two weeks. Also, our theory of change came with writing a theory of change narrative, which was like writing a college essay, which meant researching and drafting and editing it. And I wanted to avoid anything that resembled writing a college paper. Grant proposals for me aren't tough enough. So like having to do that, it was just so easy to find other excuses to not do this work, even if it meant like cleaning my condo or something like it just you'd find any reason. So all I will say is find that accountability person to move the work forward. It's a key piece. 
I would not have this landed piece of uh, our theory of change without that. So with that said, what we needed to do was first list out things like what are, who are we serving and who do we think we're serving and list that out, list out the activities that we're doing within our programming. And that's really the first two steps. And then at that point, diving into more uh, structured research to see like what short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes are associated with that work was for me the the, mo the beneficial next step. Um, and that's when I created that theory of change narrative, and which is again, like a long essay paper. I will say also, I reference that narrative all the time when I'm doing grant proposals, figuring out some marketing piece. So there's a lot of secondary benefits that come from having that narrative. So you may feel like it's doing it just to get a nice, pretty one sheeter, but you will, you will probably find yourself copy and pasting pieces of it in the future. So it's well worth the time and effort. And also whiteboarding. So I, once I got all the information, like I had to just whiteboard. And so I actually still have the whiteboard with this theory of change all doodled on it. We haven't erased it. It's just sitting in my office, but that was an important piece. I took that doodle turned it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then sent the Excel spreadsheet with our narrative to a graphic designer um, who was referred to me by a colleague in San Francisco. And then she created this for us. And so I by no means could have done this myself, but for about $500, I was able to get someone to do it for me in a couple of weeks time. Well worth it. I love it. For me, it was about making sure that it was just clear and concise and remain true to what we do with space to understand that we can grow into it and take it with us as time passed. Um, I didn't want it to be confining. And we had a lot of conversations between me and the board level about language. It was very helpful to have like one or two board members to be my point people on to talk about whether or not the language sounded correct. Um, you know, there were a few times where I may have taken a long-term outcome they thought too far or unrealistic. And so we tailored it back a little bit or changed the language. And so that was all really helpful. And that's kind of how we, we landed on this. But in, in general, the exercise provided a time and a space for us to review and reflect on the organization and our work. And that is a, a benefit that goes beyond just having this one pager. Um, it really allowed us to take a look at ourselves. Um, so I, I find that to be a big benefit of the whole process. For sure. And sure. I just wanted to emphasize how nicely that uh, graphic design theory of change looks. I couldn't create that either. <laughs> this is where graphic design is actually really, really helpful. So that, that's been a, an aha I've, I've gotten out of this. Yeah. You know, when I describe sort of like why a theory of change is important, I often will just say it's really useful to have sort of like your your mental map of the impact you're trying to create on the page first before you jump into the waters of trying to measure that thing. Like once you can have that thing on the page, then it's a lot easier to figure out, okay, which parts of this do we want to focus? How do we want to measure this and that and the other? But I'm glad that you both mentioned that even just like creating this theory of change, even if it's like a little bit of a painful process, once you have it, you're going to use it in a whole bunch of different ways. And so like, you know, all, all of the, you know, the, the, the mental energy and the willpower that you need to actually finish the thing, it will come back to you, you know, if you take the time, you know, to invest and to do this. And oh, and in the chat too, Lisha, thank you so much for also providing some context because we've worked on a theory of change for your organization too. Glad you're here. Um, okay, so next question for y'all. I, I would love for you, either one of you to just, and actually both of you to just sort of describe, okay, how did you go about collecting data? to understand whether this theory of change is playing out in real life or not. And, you know, how, how much of this were, how much of the data collection were you already doing? I know, Betsy, you were already doing some stuff when you're launching into this. How much of this was new, Ryan? I think more of this was new for you. So maybe, Betsy, if I could kind of turn over to you first and love for you to describe, you know, like, how does this theory of change translate to actual processes for collecting information from the folks that you're working with? 
That's a really great question. And through this process, one of the things that we've learned is that some of the data that we assumed we were collecting, we actually weren't. And so some of those, those outputs were, you know, the, like the number, you know, whatever it was, we actually weren't capturing that or we were, but it wasn't being visualized in an easily accessible form. So like our development team through Firebase, the one of the programs we used, like they could see it. And I had to do a lot of digging to find it. So that was one of the, another aha moment for us, but you know, we're, we're always collecting backend data and that's what our community members are, our app users are choosing to provide. They can provide as much or as little information because we know that privacy concerns, veterans specifically are very, they, they don't like to share a lot about themselves. And so we wanted to give that option. And so we're collecting a lot of uh, demographic data but we're also looking at how a community member is leveraging the Objective Zero app. What resources are they accessing? You know, is it post-traumatic stress resources? Is it safe gun storage or lethal means safety for family members? Or, you know, and so for that is really interesting to us. But we're also looking at how people are connecting to peer support. And with Paul, we actually identified leveraging a, a program called Metabase, which is a business intelligence tool to help us visualize the data. You know, there's so many programs out there to help you kind of synthesize the data or visualize it in a way that's just easy to digest. And so we've built a lot of back end channels through Metabase, which have been especially helpful for like grant applications and reporting data analysis, and then also sharing some of this information with our, with our partners. For example, we're a community partner of the VA and, you know, they're it's helped for them help for them to know, you know, how many veterans were actually getting to the VA because, you know, like what was mentioned before, kind of those stories of hope. We've learned that when a veteran is connecting with a, with a peer and that that veteran has been like, you know, actually I went to the VA, I went to the vet center. It was fantastic. You really need to try it. So being able to determine where referrals are being made and what resources are being self-selected have been really helpful for us. Um, and I feel like, like I mentioned earlier, we also implemented an in-app survey to obtain instant feedback after a call or text connection between a community member and one of our volunteers. And so we're getting feedback on both sides of the call or text to see how it went. Maybe there was an issue or, you know, we're getting a lot of testimonials uh, through that fashion. We, we do a testimonial Tuesday, so we're taking that data and sharing those stories of hope through our social media. Um, and then we're also leveraging online surveys. And over the past few years, this was something that we usually did once a year using, not SurveyMonkey, Alchemer, not Alchemer, using Alchemer to send out those uh, surveys once a year. And we've done it in a few different ways. We've done it targeted. So we targeted community members that use the app like in the last three to six months to kind of understand some of our short and intermediate term outcomes. We've opened it up because sometimes surveys, people don't want to answer them. Everyone has survey fatigue, especially in the military and veteran community. There's surveys all the time. So we had to open it up sometimes because one of those issues that we've had is getting those that, that feedback through surveys. But come over the next three to 12 months, we're actually going to do a little bit more frequent surveys due to some of our current grant requirements. And because we just released this brand new version of the app, we want some of that feedback near instantaneously as well and, and a little bit more in-depth feedback than what our, our really short in-app survey provides. Thanks, Betsy. That was, I, I talk about kids playing. <laughs> and it's so, it's, it's so fascinating to hear about your, your side of things because there's so many other factors involved. And my data collection was in part so much easier because when you have five to 11 year olds and you say, I need you to answer this question and they're right in front of you, they're going to answer for the most part. So it, it, it was much easier for our data collection to, to have, to, to run. And I, I saw Alicia's question here about how do you create data percentage goals um, when you may not have past impact data. So many of these questions I felt I, I would have, and I get so flustered by these questions that I it would like scare me from not doing anything. And so I, I took a step back and said, what I'm doing now 
is just creating baseline data. I don't know what success looks like, really, because this is all new. And so for me, it was more about creating baselines. You can research baselines, which I learned from Paul. Like if other people have done this work for other in other areas, you can find a baseline for what success looks like, or you can just create your own in the first year that you're collecting data. So for our data collection, I'll share, we decided to focus on, there's so many things we could do. So we focused on three key questions that I wanted to answer for the organization. We are a free play based program, which means we do a lot of social emotional learning. And so for us, that meant, you know, I wanted to know if kids were making friends with other kids. And, and then I, the other thing we wanted to do, we, we felt like our outdoor time was uh, far more extensive than some other programs, but I wanted to know if that was actually true. So we decided to make that a question. And then we wanted to see if we don't focus a lot on family services, but I kind of had a gut feeling that we were helping families in some way and creating connections and community with families. And so we posed that as our third question. And we decided in our initial data collection to only focus in these three areas. It was extremely helpful to only focus in these three areas so that I didn't feel overwhelmed with all of the things that we could evaluate. It was just these three things made it far more approachable. So once we figured out those three questions, again, this was through Paul. I can't take credit for knowing how to do any of this, but we, I, you know, I had to go through, my homework was to go through and answer the, the questions in this spreadsheet. Why does, why do these questions matter? What are data collection methods that are out there? Often, you know, I found through this project that I don't need to reinvent the wheel. S someone may have already done it. I and mean, I just need to like kind of piece it all together and make it feel right for my organization. So we went through this exercise and then we found what metrics we might be looking for and then the different ways in which we would collect data. So then we, there were three key methods that we did. One was I used Google Forms to survey kids and I just took kids one by one ask them these questions because kids between the ages of five and 11 have different literacy levels to make it kind of standard. I verbally asked each of them the questions and then recorded their answers so that it was the same for everybody. For uh, families, food is a great motivator to get people to do stuff. And so we were already having a spring pizza party. And so I did a thing. I created a QR code for a Google form that was accessible on mobile devices. And we had iPads and tablets for families who may not have mobile devices. And I said, I need to see your completion screen before you get a piece of pizza from me. And then I ticked each family that responded. And then I followed up with any families that were absent. And I ended up getting all but two families responded for that survey. And then for outdoor time, you know, we just wanted to see how many minutes kids were spending outside. And so that was just me with a spreadsheet and a pen and a piece of paper and a clipboard going outside and marking off things. It was not rocket science. It was just as simple as that. And then plugging the information into, into a spreadsheet. And so those were the three methods we used and Google forms we found was incredibly, well, one it's free and two easy and quite accessible for us. So that was really helpful. Yeah. And I love, I was just going to say, I love this contrast <laughs> because Ryan, you're, you know, your scenario was like, there's a lot of hands-on that went on with your program, but it was actually real. You, you made it relatively easy. Like you said, not rocket science to build data collection into that. And yeah, you use some tools like Google forms and Google sheets and that sort of thing. But I think the key for both of you is that it's sort of built in find, finding like low cost ways to build data collection into the work, you know, for Betsy, you get all this data from an app. But it, just because you get the data doesn't mean it's easy to interact with. And that's where a tool like Metabase, which I think somebody mentioned Power BI in here, Metabase is similar. Metabase is sort of a free business intelligence tool and it layered over that database. So it allowed you to sort of unlock some of that data and make it a little bit easier to access. So I, I just think it's really cool to see the contrast of like very different data collection methods. But if we can find way, low cost ways to integrate it into the existing work, it's still possible. It doesn't become a new full-time job to do it. Oh, Flora, I see your question. Do you, do you, I see you on video. Do you want to just ask your question? Sure. Yeah, I can just hop in. 
I actually am representing Colorado Young Leaders. We're a small nonprofit based out of um, Denver, and we work with high schoolers related to community service in other nonprofit partners in the region. And we work all over the state. Um, but something I'm really curious about, uh, I have some sort of academic experience with qualitative data coding, but I'm really curious about focus groups as extensions to surveys. And curious if you guys have had any experience with that, pros and cons, especially curious, Ryan, with your experience, because you work with children. I was especially inspired hearing about um, your use of like verbal surveying as a way to get around accessibility barriers and literacy barriers. So curious if you have experience in that or any thoughts around focus groups. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we didn't, outside of me just asking the kids the, the individual list of questions, we didn't put them in a group, although kids were often around and like t pushing the kids to answer the questions, like to come to me to answer questions. The two things that for, because they're under the age of 18, what I made sure parents knew it was happening and did a assumed opt-in. So I let them know that it was happening between these days. And if they didn't let me know by X date that they wanted to opt out, that we were going to do it. And I also did not tie any uh, identifying information to the survey. So they, I could, if I, when I went back to the data, I couldn't connect the data to the kids. Uh, and the family surveys also, they had more demographic information because I needed that, but that was uh, all anonymous. But for the kids, there was no identifying information. And even now with some of the data we're collecting, I'm making sure that it's, <sighs> as unidentifiable as possible. For this particular study, I made sure there was no identifying information and I also didn't need it. So I think that's, those are two key pieces that help. And I think it helps with also a little bit of those privacy questions. Let's see, did y'all have anything to add about focus groups or like maybe more qualitative data collection approaches that you've layered over. I, I vaguely recall you might have done some of that at one point, but I'm not certain. We actually tried doing focus groups. We built it into our evaluation plan and we got one or two veterans that were willing to participate. We sent, Glory sent them the invites and no one showed up. And so, and we're doing this all in a virtual environment. And, you know, I think there's a couple of things for the reasons behind it, because all of the questions that we're asking are surrounded about around mental health and how socially connected you are and kind of going through, we were using the focus groups. Our idea was to kind of take our results that we received and help them help, have them help us kind of go through it and give their perspective on, you know, the the awareness of veteran suicide or that the belief that uh, the resources that we're providing are helpful. Um, that's actually something that we're looking to do as we go into evaluating um, version two of our app and hopefully doing it in person. And there's nothing um, kind of attached in terms of own personal health or mental health that will be attached to it. So I, we think for us, it was more of a privacy issue than anything. We really did focus on one-on-one. -on -one. So Glory did, I, I don't remember the number of them, but did several phone interviews so that the service member or veteran could call into a, we didn't do it video. It was through, through calling and did some of the things that we were planning to do with focus groups on kind of, what do you think about these results? We actually had one of our board members that agreed to do it and provided probably some of the best information. And I thought it was really great that they were willing to provide feedback on the results. Not all board members were as interested in with, with him. So getting that perspective from someone that's retired from the military, that has kind of an educational and teaching background was, was really great. But also that helped us build a little bit more of the testimonials on, you know, what worked and they could share their perspectives on social connectedness and how, you know, perhaps we were helping them with their social connectedness. And they would share more information about the great interactions they had with either a community member or one of our volunteers. So for us, the one-on-one -on -one interviews were incredibly beneficial because we just got so much more information that we wouldn't have gotten through a survey because no one's going to want to type that conversation or that experience. So I, I would highly recommend that the interviews, the one-on-ones, but I do think there's a lot of value in focus groups and we hope to do it in the future. Thank you both. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. And Flora, the only thing else I would add, which is kind of a, maybe a little bit of a repeat from this, but 
I, I found from, from many clients that like focus groups can be super, super valuable. I mean, qualitative can be super valuable. Focus groups can be valuable if it's feasible. If there is a venue where people are already gathered that you can tap into already, like if you've got a youth group already and you just set aside some time, great. Then that, that means it's easily doable. I think for, you know, in our, I remember that task now, Betsy, with objective zero of like, we tried to organize a focus group and it just like, it didn't, it wasn't fitting into the normal work in any way. So between that and the privacy stuff, you just, it's just hard to get people to show up. And I've actually seen the same, I mean, I've read enough enough randomized control trials where I'll, uh, somebody's paying maybe $200,000 to hire an evaluator and they try and do focus groups and it logistically doesn't work out particularly well. I think you have to have a venue where people are already gathered or highly likely to gather and then you can sort of tap into that. But if that opportunity isn't available, it's generally easier to have one-on-one -on -one conversations because schedules because life, you know, all of that. So I, I think it's super valuable and they tend to be one of the logistically tougher methods to pull off for, for those reasons. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, Ernest. Like focus groups and other qualitative like interviews help you get some of that story, some of that nuance, which I think is is huge. So Okay, so Ryan and Betsy, so we've we've got I, I've got a couple more, just a couple more questions for you in the last you know, about twenty minutes that we've got together here. I think the last show and tell item. I wanted you to both have the opportunity to show off. Like, what what are some of these sort of analysis products or the data products that you created? So you have a theory of change. You focus data collection. Like, what came of it? And would love for you to just maybe get, show, show us show us an example from your organization so we get the flavor of like what the end result was of some of the evaluation work y'all did. Either one of you want to go first? Sure, I'll do it. Let me share my screen. I think I got set it up on a way that actually works this time. So let me share. All right, can we see it? All right. Yeah, we see 2021 uh, impact report. So this is one of the, the products that we did. So when we think about kind of how we're analyzing and reporting on our data, we're, you know, like, like you said, Paul, you know, qualitative and quantitative is so important. And we think we both, we need both types to really share a story. And we did this um, in 2021. I figured this would be easier to share than one of our 60 page learning reports or <laughs> a one page or, um, see here. So what we did is we sent this out both in our email newsletter, as well as it's on our website. So we've got some of our, our learning reports from previous years. And so what we did was kind of share what we did with our evaluation project. And this was for 2020. I think, I believe this was our, maybe this was our, our first year of funding through the, the, the CDC. But what we did is kind of shared our logic model and shared some of the, the metrics that we had. And this has actually changed since then. It's more percentages of, of some of our feed, feedback. But if you look at our logic model, if I go back here and look at some of those outputs that we had, just sharing, you know, this is what we did in 2020. You know, this was during COVID. We saw huge spikes in people reaching out for support. We were able to support over 13,000 service members, veterans, family members, and caregivers. We trained over 200 people in suicide prevention. One of the things that we love is we send out every week, we send out caring messages. And this is based on Jerome Model from back like post World War II that did a study and he, they just sent just caring messages. And so like one of the ones that we do is, you know, on Sunday nights, we send out a note just saying, Hey, just want to let you know, whatever this week throws at you, you can tackle it. You, you've got this. And so being able to share, you know, what we were able to do and some of that impact specifically through numbers is something that we did in 2020. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, we, we can't quantify the number of people's lives that we saved, but going through some of our research, we learned that on average, 135 people are affected by every one suicide. And we had um, over 10,000 people or about uh, 10,000 people on the app. And we potentially positively impacted the lives of 1.3 million people. And then just sharing some of the metrics about how we have both users and community members in all 50 states and almost 30 countries across, across the globe. I think we're at 32 or 33. So kind of wherever service members and veterans are, we actually have 
people in those areas leveraging the Objective Zero app to get support or give support. And then we also used it to acknowledge some of our, our partners. And then finally, we took one of um, some of the, through Alchemer, um, you'll see in the top right-hand corner, um, we did one of those little boards about the, the feedback we got and those commonly um, used words. So we wanted to make sure that we were including that, you know, as a fun little, little additive on there. But that is what, you know, we have put out and we're constantly sending out messaging using social media on some of our some of our latest results, for example, we found in our last program evaluation that over 90% of the people that we surveyed knew the issue, how bad the issue of veteran service, uh, excuse me, veteran suicide was. And so for us, it confirmed that moving from awareness into action is really important to what we're doing. And so just being able to share that kind of information to those that we serve, our partners, and basically all stakeholders is, you know, incredibly important. Love it. Looks great, Betsy. I was just typing in the chat. I realized both you and Ryan are big Canva users, by the way. That Canva is that tool that is sort of like a, a, a lightweight graphic design tool. It helps you create some, some things like this. So Ryan, I know that you've done some cool stuff in there too, if you want to show it off. And a Canva Pro is free for nonprofits. Oh, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Game changer. So for us, we I'll, I'm just going to show our one pager. And so we, again, we're looking at friendship, outdoor time, and family relationships. For us, cross-age friendship was particularly important because our program, one of our differentiating factors from other programs is that kids across grades are spending time together in our after-school program. And so we went and asked kids, do you have friends in another grade? At one point, I remember thinking like, oh, how am I going to know if they're actually friends or not, right? Like, but then I realized I'm not doing a quality study. Like, I don't need to know the quality of their friendship. I, in, in finding benchmarks, there was one that said, like, you, you talk to this person, then you talk to this person, you see if they say each other's name, and then that's the friendship. And I was like, no, no, no. I also don't want to know that information. I just need to know if they think they've had friends here and if they made a friend in a different grade. For me, that's what's important. They define friendship for themselves. I don't define it for them. And I don't, I don't need to know the quality of it. I just need to know if they think they have a friend in a different grade here. So we answered those questions. And then, and then similarly with family relationships, we asked like, have you asked another family for support? Have you made a, another a friends with another family at Mariposa Kids? In reviewing the data, we pulled out to see, you know, pivot tables became my new friend in Excel. And I, I kind of looked to see like, are there any differences based on with kids with like age or gender or combination of those factors? And there wasn't. And then with families, it was like, was there any difference between income levels, education levels, race? And there, there wasn't any big differentiating factors. So we felt comfortable reporting these numbers as they are, because there were no other factors that really pulled the, the data one way or another. And then for us, like our the bottom line of the results was the most impactful for us, where it's like, we believe our, we now know that our program does encourage more cross age relationships. We know that our program has more outdoor time than the CDC recommended amount of 60 minutes. And we know that families are making relationships with others because of our programming. Um, and then we were able to, you know, just take it and blitz it on social media. Um, and I continue to just like refresh it with these graphics every so often, um, just to remind people, this is what we're doing. Um, and so it became really helpful in that way. And, and I'll offer too, like when it starts feeling too complicated, just take a step back and see if you can simplify it. And it, it becomes far more approachable at that time. It was so easy to be like, oh, what if, what if? Take a step back and it can be as simple as, hey, did you make a friend or not? Now, I saw someone wrote in the chat when they asked kids questions, they got far more information than what they asked for. That also happened to me. Like I was finding out that like John is mean to so-and-so and this person was nicer than that person. Great. But I, I it wasn't important for this, uh, but it is in the back of my head. Uh, so I do know it and it was helpful. But that's kind of what we did with our data. 
This is an interesting question related to this, Ryan. Ali just posted, use verbal surveys. They sometimes, kids sometimes respond with unhelpful responses. <laughs> what do you do with that? <laughs> You're the you're the you're the child development expert much more than I am. What what are your reactions? Well, there is the one thing I had to tell myself was that this was not a scientific study. Like I'm not working for the CDC. And so if I was asking kids a question and they I could tell that they were leaning towards an answer, I could I would repeat the the possible responses and then try and get it out of them. I had to remind myself that what I was doing here was not, again, not a CDC report, not this big government report. We're a small nonprofit that just needs to know if this is happening. But we also changed the language so that rather than saying, do you strongly agree, agree, kind of, or slightly disagree, disagree, that we changed the language to like a lot because kids tend to say like a lot. Yeah, kind of, no. So we use that language and associated that on the back end with what the actual responses would be in our report so that the kids kind of understood in their minds what those responses would be. So it's a combination of taking a step back to see like, okay, how serious do I need these answers to be? And then two, doing as much as you can with the language of the questions to make it feel more approachable for the child or for the children in your space. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, Ryan. Yeah, I think that playing around with the question phrasing can help. And the truth might be too, maybe it's just like an open-ended question of a certain sort isn't, doesn't land right for that age of kid. If you're serving a certain a range of ages, like I've had to do this where it's like, oh, actually, we should only ask this question to our older kids because they're in a position where they can get it. And it's a bit unfair to ask all of the younger kids to to get it. And I don't don't trust that. So so I I've run into that a couple of times too. So I've I've got one more question for Ryan and Betsy, which is related to the sort of financial aspect and goes all the way back to Patrice. You had asked a really good question of like, okay, so what's the financial financial and staff commitment that you need to make this happen. I, I wanted to add to that and just, just ask you both to describe how did how did you fund this? It might have just come from GNA. I know for Betsy it came from a particular grant, but like how did you fund it and how much how much money and staff commitment did it take? <laughs> you know, I think that just kind of getting those, I mean it's going to be different for everybody, but it's useful to like, you know, have give folks some specific reference points, I guess, for this. I'm happy to start. You know, we were very, very blessed to be approached by the CDC. They created a grant program called the Veteran Suicide Prevention Evaluation Project, and it was launched the year prior to our first grant funding. And that first year of funding, we received fifty thousand dollars to that would allow. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, fifty thousand dollars that would pay for salary, consultant fees, kind of any of those additional like tools or, you know, whatever it might be is up to $50,000 we were able to use towards that. And so, you know, it, it was really, really great for us with this particular program. We were a recipient of it for three years. And not only did we get financial funding, we were able to hire on Paul as a consultant for that, which was an absolute game changer because there is no way that me by myself, even with CDC experts could have produce the same quality of materials, data analysis, had I not had Paul kind of as a teammate working on that. You know, Ryan, you had some of the, the materials that, you, you know, you work with Paul on and Paul is much, much more organized than I think I will ever be. And, you know, his knowledge and experience for us was so helpful. And I know that so many organizations, especially those smaller organizations, just don't have that. And so for us, it was the ability to, to build the capacity. Um, we were able to build our, our logic model, our theory of change, um, develop um, an evaluation plan, and on a monthly basis over nine months, work with the CDC experts and have technical assistance on all of these products. I mean, I think one of our last um, evaluations, we went through like 20 iterations of our, um, one of our um, grant or our um, evaluation plan. Like it was, they were always in the, the further, you know, by the third year, like they were very, very specific on what they wanted and what they expected of us because at the end of that three years, like there was no more funding, like, we still get support. We send stuff our, their way. 
Um, but I wanted to share a tool that anyone has access to. We use the CDC evaluation framework. And if you go to the CDC website or Google CDC evaluation framework, that is a free resource available to anyone. And it's, it's tried and true. Yeah, and that's that's what we use to well we had the, the CDC support on it and the uh, and their experts, but it is such such a great tool um, for anyone to use just to get started. And you know, I think you can put as much or as little time and effort into program evaluation. It does not need to be this big pro, you know, this big solution to a problem. Or like Ryan said, like we tried just to like evaluate all the things our first year. I think we had like eight learning questions, and like you can pick two. I think we ended up doing three, but then the next year we were able to take, you know, those learning questions we had existing and, you know, use those. And so for the evaluation process, it is just, you know, you're consistently taking your, your products and your evaluation and what you're learning. And it's constantly evolving, just like our logic model. So, you know, it's, it's been really great for us. And I really wish there were more funders and opportunities that people and organizations had to have that extra financial and expert support so that more people could do it because it is such an important process and such an important piece of our nonprofit work. Awesome. That's it. Really quick. I'm curious, like now, like how much time a week do you and Glory spend on a value, you know, like to give people a range of like, you know, what it takes. Well, we're, when we're not in the process, it's very, very little. We're just kind of monitoring the data that we're collecting because at this point, basically everything's running by itself in terms of our, our meta-based dashboard, everything populates. And so it's, you know, but in, in the midst of it, Gloria was doing much, much more work than I was. You know, it can be a full-time job for a person, but I think she was able to put in, and Gloria, feel free to put in the comments. I, I want to say, you know, between... 15 to 20 hours a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. When we were working on the surveys and the data analysis, it was much more. But yeah, she really took the lead on that. So I didn't have to do as much work as I did in the first couple of years of the process. Yeah. Yay, Glory. Critical. <laughs> and then, right, let me just pass the same question to you, you know, about what what time, what time and funding commitment did it take and how do you how do you manage that? Yeah, for from funding, we decided I asked the board to release a little bit of money from our reserves to kickstart the program. And so they agreed to release uh, initially $5,000 from the, our reserves to kickstart it. And that helped us get through the theory, like to get our theory of change started. And then once we had that, the, the time worked out that the fiscal year changed. And so I went to one of our funders who likes to fund projects and so the Ashbury Children's Foundation. And I said, I, we have this project and it's gonna be really helpful for us. And we, were, we wanna know if you're interested in funding. It. And they knew the timelines we were at. And so they decided to partner with us through funding to help support our work with consultants and, and also pay for staff time and to make sure that we could deliver on this report. And so it was a combination of both reserves and private foundation funding. The one thing I will offer everyone here is to make sure if you're ever creating a budget for a project like this, to definitely account for staff time. Um, because funders will, so often when we think of how to make a proposal, we forget that the time, like my time is used, you know, other directors' times are used, and we need money to pay those people to do the work. So it needs to be built into the budgets. And so... That was a big piece of making sure we had the budget for this project built correctly so that we could go out and ask for funding for it. And so that's where we were able to be successful. And now I would say, I think our we're doing, it's probably like an hour a month of, of work to get the kind of just like little data that we want. We just, we don't need a whole bunch. We just need some really good data points. Um, I also was telling my board and, and, I, and I'm using this as my philosophy. I don't want kids to feel like test subjects in a weird, bizarre project. Um, and so I don't want us to like continually be asking them questions and feel like they're like these test subjects. And so for that reason, we're trying to work on balancing out how we do data and what that looks like and ensuring that like fun is one of our values and we have to live by that. And we wanna make sure that the kid's experience is not impacted by our desire for data to talk about our work. And so that's the balance that I'm working on. So right now we're just doing a little bit every month 
and making sure that the kids feel it's fun each time. Yeah, absolutely. Ryan, I guess similar question to you, like in the heat of the project, you know, you're working on that learning report, all that, like how much time in your week, you know, were you putting towards this work? I think I would say averaged, I'll go with an average of two. Okay. But it went yeah. in waves. So it'd be like yeah. five. It was, that's an average. It definitely goes in waves. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You know, data collection weeks, it was 10. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's super helpful just to set some reasonable expectations. So let's let's wrap up here. I know that many of y'all need to go and I've kept you for 90 minutes, which is long enough. So really, really quick, I'm, I'm going to share the Objective Zero Mariposa Kids websites. Um, Betsy and Ryan, you want to just like pop in. Are there any ways in particular that you'd love for folks to know how to support Objective Zero and Mariposa Kids? So for Objective Zero, we think there's three ways that anyone can support our efforts. You can be a champion, connect, or contribute. And for be a champion, if you know a veteran in your life that could benefit from um, peer support, share Objective Zero as a resource. If there's people within your network that you know might be interested in what we're doing, let us link up. Or you can contribute your time and become a volunteer for us. It's not for everyone, but it's a really, really meaningful way to give back to our military and veteran community. For sure. Yeah, and I would say I've been learning more and more about community-centric fundraising, which is taking principles of fundraising and moving from a scarcity mindset to a mindset of abundance. And in that, that means sharing connections and resources and working in, with community. I think community issues will be solved with community response. And so I love partnerships and bridge building and connections and introductions, and I'm happy to make introductions. And so I would say that's probably one of the biggest pieces that we as a community can help each other. And Mariposa Kids plays a part in that. So I, I would uh, leave with that. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, so I'll share the slides for this, some of the resources that y'all have shared. Feel free to get in touch with me. My LinkedIn and my email are here. I'll share out this. I've got this data fitness quiz and a guide for leveraging small valuation grants I think are going to be maybe relevant for folks in this call. So that will go out in the email in addition to the recording. And then um, last but not least, I offer data coaching to folks. Ryan was one of the participants in this and did really, really awesome work. And so happy to have a conversation if that sort of thing is helpful in guiding any of the other folks who are leading small nonprofits in the room to navigate this journey wisely. So, so with that, that's, that's all we have. Thank y'all so much for joining us. Huge, huge kudos to Betsy and Ryan. Very, very grateful for y'all sharing your story. I know that many other people will see the recording, so I'll let you go. Just, just thanks again for, for sharing this. It was awesome to see you both and awesome to see everybody on this call. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank Betsy. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Bye everybody.